Great to be here. It's great to see you all here. Um, so it seems only right that on this day where we're doing something new in Perth, um, which makes it a, an auspicious day, um, and on a day when we're talking about heritage as well as um, you know, celebrating the joys of creativity, um, that we really kick off by acknowledging the traditional, traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting the Wajak Noongar people and formally give our respect towards their continuing cultural, spiritual and relig religious practices um, and to recognise the strength and the resilience and the capacity of Noongar people in this land. I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. When um, the European invasion of this country commenced in 1788, uh, there were more distinct Indigenous language dialects spread across Australia than Europe. Um, our neck of the woods is the traditional country of the Noongar people, which spreads right across the southwest. Uh, archaeological evidence establishes that the Noongar people have lived in this area for at least 45,000 years. There are 14 different language groups that make up Noongar. Uh, Perth is located in Wadjuk country. And today, the Noongar people are one of the largest Aboriginal cultural blocks in Australia, as well as one of the strongest, um, which is awesome. And it makes us very privileged and very lucky, and some would say blessed, that we get to be living in Noongar country. So heritage. When um, Michael contacted me out of the blue and asked if I'd be interested in being the first speaker in the Creative Morning series for Perth, I was, of course, deeply honoured. When he then told me that the theme I'd be responding to was heritage, I became a little perplexed. Um, this quietly, quickly migrated towards mild insult. Um, having recently turned 40, I'm still a little sensitive <laughs> about any kind of illusion that I could well be past my prime. And being asked to talk about heritage did nothing to help with this. Uh, the purchase of a ridiculous vintage sports car also didn't help with this. Neither did adopting the alter ego persona of an alien lobster who's in the middle of the photo. It's like, where's Wally? Just weirder. Uh, my best friends, however, they approved of the purchase thoroughly. Uh, the next communication that Michael sent um, was all about what was expected of me. Um, this email contained the phrase, do not rant. It was repeated in the email, five times. <laughs> I'm not sure who Michael has been speaking to, but I obviously have a, a rant reputation that I wasn't aware of. Um, so uh, I will endeavour not to rant, but I really cannot guarantee that I won't ramble. <laughs> Act one, heritage. So when I got past this uh, smells a bit like mothballs prejudice that I was feeling towards this theme of heritage and started to, I guess, think about what heritage might mean for me personally as much as, um, you know, as a modus operandi of, of practice, um, I, I realised that, well, for starters, registered heritage buildings have actually been an important and consistent part of my life story. Um, I spent my first six years 
in a heritage listed building called Lenaville, which was built for the chief warder of the Fremantle Jail in 1885. Uh, when my family lived there, it was pre this uh, renovation and it was a bit of a wreck, but it did have this amazing hole in the floor that you could climb down into a limestone cave under the house, which as a child is pretty amazing. Um, I now live in a, in a heritage listed building called Congress Hall or the People's Palace, which was converted into apartments by Brian Klopper in 1993. Um, it's two doors away from a heritage building recently acquired and refurbished by the National Trust. Uh, that, that building was originally built to house the state government's first health department and it was the home to the notorious A.O. Neville's 23-year uh, reign as the Chief Protector of Aborigines from 1922 to 1945. Um, notorious, of course, due to his stolen generation policies, which saw the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their parents to be assimilated into white society. On a cheerier note, the building is next door to the current home of the Uriakan Theatre Company, um, which is one of the reasons why I moved into, into the building. Um, in looking back and thinking about heritage, I also realised that, that most of my working practice has had to do with either responding to heritage buildings or seeking to temporarily bring them back to life through alternate communal occupations. Um, and I wasn't going to mention Jack Sue, but, but Michael did, so thanks for that. It was a, it was a crazy time, and I don't have any photos from it, <laughs> thankfully. Um, look, the work I'm still most proud of um, as, a, you know, as a solo artist um, is this sculpture that uh, I completed with Christian De Vitri in 2011 called Ascalon. Uh, the Wallpaper City Guide to Perth says that uh, thanks to its progressive design and the discussion it provoked, it was a local icon even before its unveiling. It has certainly put the spotlight back on Surrey-born architect Edmund Blackett's 1888 cathedral. Uh, David Wish Wilson also mentions Ascalon in his excellent book, which is titled simply Perth, uh, referring to, quoting, uh, all 18 metres of St George's seemingly diaphanous white silk cloak, billowing around the stainless steel lance thrust, in th thrust into the ground outside the 1888 cathedral named after him. From another perspective, though, it's hard not to read the planted spear as yet another statement of violent possession. After all, it wasn't far from St George's Cathedral that the corpse of Yagan's father, Mijaguru, was hung from a tree on the terrace for three days in 1833. He had been executed by a firing squad in front of a cheering crowd. End of quote. Um, but Perth, David Wish Wilson, cannot recommend this book highly enough. As many of you will be aware, um, the new Kerry Hill Library is being built behind the cathedral as we speak, and the old treasury buildings next to it are undergoing a complete renovation and repurpose, including what is set to be an extraordinary boutique hotel. Uh, I'm currently working on some other public artworks in the precinct on the other side of the treasury buildings where the Kerry Hill design tower is currently being built. Uh, the first is with artist Tom Mueller. It's called Dirty Deeds and it's on the site of the original police cells or court police cells which is um, the little area in, in red here. Um, in 2012 on that site, on the site on which the tower is, is being built, uh, we staged the Fringe World Festival's uh, Treasure Chess Club and uh, this is uh, Bob Logg II uh, at the opening concert. We also used a range of spaces inside the old treasury buildings for the festival, um, including the old postal hall. And um, I guess one of our hopes was always that when people go back to this building once it's been repurposed, that it's really part of their, their memory of the space, is this uh, temporary festival activation uh, before it becomes something new. But um, 
back to the work Dirty Deeds. So Tom and I uh, dug back into the police records of the day and selected a range of individuals um, who were held in the cells awaiting trial. Um, and in a, in a bit of a play with the traditional format of the foundation stone, as well as the, um, the commemorative pavers that run along St George's Terrace, celebrating the lives and achievements of WA's big achievers, um, we're, we're celebrating the misdemeanours and dirty deeds of some, some of our very early criminals. Um, here's one example. So these are direct quotes from some of the police records of the day. Um, and it seems somehow ironic that, um, you know, at the next council meeting, the council are deciding whether Rolf Harris's paver will actually be removed from St George's Terrace. Um, don't know if it'll be welcome on the, uh, the Dirty Deeds site either, but it does seem that Stalinist revisionism is alive and well in contemporary Perth. <laughs> On the subject of people, given the decision-making power to determine what constitutes worthy heritage for future generations, so six days ago, the Director-General of UNESCO, Mrs. Irina Bokova, in her opening address to a Council of Ministers of Culture, stated that culture brings sustainability of development by making it meaningful to people, by deepening ownership and participation, by making sure it is of the people, for the people, and by the people. A UNESCO World Heritage Site is a place that is listed by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation as a special cultural or of, of special cultural or physical significance. Um, as you can see in this map, as of 2014, 1,007 sites are listed across the world. 779 of them are cultural, and three of these cultural sites are in Australia. One's the Sydney Opera House. One is the Royal Exhibition Hall and Carlton Gardens in Melbourne, built to host the World's Fair in 1880. And the third is a collection of the best 11 of the 3,000 plus convict sites that remain in Australia. Uh, one of the 11 is Fremantle Prison. So it means we've got one eleventh of a World Heritage Cultural Significance Site in WA, which just seems remarkably strange. Uh, protecting our heritage and fostering creativity is a key current UNESCO strategic goal. And conventions in this realm are numerous, including the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, the 1972 Convention for the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage, the Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity of 2001, and the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage of 2003. And by intangible, they mean living culture. Australia has no intangible living cultural masterpieces, according to UNESCO. From the convention, the intangible cultural heritage means the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated therewith, the communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals, recognise as part of their cultural heritage. This intangible cultural heritage, transmitted from generation to generation, is constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment, their interaction with nature and their history, and provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. The intangible cultural heritage is manifested inter alia in the following domains. A, oral traditions and expressions. B, performing arts. C, social practices, rituals, and festive events. D, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe. And E, traditional craftsmanship. So if you overlay the places that creative mornings is occurring, Across the, uh, across the world, they all seem to be occurring in places that don't have any uh, intangible cultural heritage of humanity. If you overlay the places that fringe festivals are occurring across the world, 
it's a similar kind of pattern. If you overlay both together, then you're starting to fill up some serious space. Act two, heretics. The etymology of the word heretics comes from ancient Greek. It means simply choice. Before it became associated specifically with church doctrine, it referred more generally to a provocative belief or theory, theory strongly at variance with established beliefs or customs. And here's where we get to talk about some intangible heritage of our own in a contemporary sense. So this photo is uh, a photo of a local history full of heretics and heroes who contributed to the 30 year plus history of, of Outrage. Outrage is the organisation that produced fr the Fringe World Festival. Um, the photo was taken at the 25th anniversary of Outrage and Cliff Gillam, one of Outrage's first chairs, um, gave a really stirring speech. I wanted to quote from part of it because um, it's very heartfelt and speaks to some of these, these themes. So Cliff said, when I first became a member of the Fringe Festival Society in 1983, I had no idea that the society and the organisation it morphed into would keep me engaged directly for almost 10 years nor that it would become the successful and necessary vehicle for the support of emergent and innovative art in Perth that 25 years later it now is. A lot has changed since 1983, but one thing has not changed, and I pray it never will, and that is that in any reasonably sized city there moves amongst us a small number, comparatively, of driven and visionary souls who find themselves compelled to explore incessantly and find a fresh language to express the mystery of being human. They are called artists. Some of them become famous and wealthy. Some even lend their names posthumously to public buildings, but most do not. The idea that underpinned the first Fringe Festival in 1983, and one that I am pleased to say sustains Outrage today, was the notion that there was a need to build a platform upon which the work of not famous and not wealthy artists could be delivered in celebration of their explorations and their discoveries to those in the broader West Australian community who hungered for new insight and new kinds of aesthetic experience. End of quote. And it's the second time today I get to say I pay my respect to elders past, present and future. So Fringe, it started in Edinburgh in 1947 and it is a, a story of, of heresy, if you will. The world's first uh, high art main stage festival occurred in the same year at Edinburgh and uh, it was all about imports and a group of local uh, theatre companies got together and decided that they'd just start putting performances on at the same time as the International Arts Festival and a local journalist coined the term fringe as in they were operating on the fringe of the main festival. Since that point, Fringe has uh, become a worldwide phenomenon. The Edinburgh Fringe is the single largest cultural event in the world. Um, they sold over one and a half million tickets last festival. Uh, Fringe World Festival Perth isn't, isn't that big. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully. Um, but it's, it has uh, gotten some traction pretty fast. In, in the four years since uh, we launched Fringe World in 2011, it has actually become the fourth, maybe fifth largest fringe in the world. Um, and one of the ground rules that was set for this whole presentation was, was not to use it as a sales opportunity. <laughs> so I'm going to whiz through these slides. It's all very good. It's all very successful. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Great, okay, and um, <clears throat> uh, what, oh, that's, uh, that's our Spiegel tent. Um, the Spiegel tent's an interesting thing to consider when you're talking about heritage. Um, parts of the Spiegel tent are, are over 100 years old. Um, it was one of the smartest things that I think Cartwright has ever done was purchasing a Spiegel tent and bringing it to Perth. Um, it really helped us to establish the Fringe World brand and experience and, and kind of introduce Perth to a certain 
way of looking at this type of festival and, and cultural production. Um, Lottery West supported us in, in acquiring this uh, Spiegel tent and uh, they did so because we were also committed with the idea that we could tour it to regional Western Australia. Um, that was one of the reasons why the, uh, the Spiegel tent family that sold it to us actually agreed to do so. They'd never sold any of their Spiegel tents, they're quite rare. And um, he's like gratuitous burlesque performers in regional setting photo. Um, but we have toured the Spiegel tent to regional WA since, um, since it came to Perth. Um, I'm kind of wrapping this, this part of the thing up, but that's a, um, a rather nice photo of the Perth skyline from Rooftop Movies. And we get to Act 3. It's, uh, we may be at the end of the earth. I feel like it's the end of the world as we know it, and I do feel fine. We're in the midst of great change in Perth, and it's, um, you know, as cultural producers, um, it's great to be a part of that. It's a real zeitgeist moment. It's fantastic that this square is called Jagen Square. It's a nice counter to um, Elizabeth Key. Um, the other work that um, I'm working on for the old treasury buildings I'm doing with Dr Noel Nanup, um, who's one of my personal heroes. And if you ever get a chance to do one of uh, Noel's cultural um, heritage workshops, you really should. Uh, we'll probably change the way you look at some things. Uh, the work that we've developed together is, again, it's a text-based work that is embedded throughout the site. And uh, we've searched through the archives of uh, West Australian white history and found some of the most um, over-the-top, kind of sentimental, celebratory, uh, early colonial poetry and grabbed phrases from it and then translated them into Noongar. Um, there's 250 different words and phrases spread throughout, throughout the site, and a good uh, chunk of those uh, are in Noongar. Um, this one, Wula Jarap Jarap Bina, means to um, happy shout of praise in the light of the morning, which is the note I'd like to end this on. And I got it in under 24 minutes, which is great because I'd never done that all the way through before and I didn't know how long it was going to take. Good. Good question. And I kind of, and thinking about this made me think about, I guess, uh, process that has defined a lot of this stuff. And a lot of it is, is very research driven um, and kind of uh, finding out a hell of a lot about a particular site um, before even starting to work with ideas. Um, and that's certainly the case with, with obviously the, the Treasury works, um, but also in the, in the festival production as, as well. Um, really, I guess, uh, thinking about the particularities of, of space and what, what might work and what might not. Um, with, with Ascalon, it, it became a lot about the researching um, that myth, if you will, the St. George myth and everything surrounding it. And um, the David Wish Wilson's reading of the work is, is quite interesting because, um, and, and a bit bang on in a way, um, uh, because Ascalon, as the name of the St George Lance, and this is a bit of a secret to the work, um, uh, actually came from kind of Christian propaganda during the, the um, uh, well, part of the, the kind of romance period where um, the Lance was named Ascalon after the site of a wholesale massacre during the First Crusades. And St George became quite a propagandic figure to try and convince people to go on the second crusades so there's you know there's a dark history there um, and that's that's something that Christian and I were really um, interested in kind of containing in the work um, not as a celebratory you know um, item at all but uh, yeah 
that it came from from a, a research driven driven space. Um, I could keep talking, <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. Um, anyone else? Hey. Um, when you, I guess, initially started coming up with for the French Festival, mm. um, did you find the city council or sort of the governance of the city to be resistant to those ideas or were they very supportive of embracing that new culture? Yeah. Look, um, I think one of the, uh, one of the things about um, doing new things in an environment like Perth and kind of the, the, you know, the red tape hurdles, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the advantages that, um, that Outrage has had is that it's got a 30 year history behind it. Um, if you were sitting outside and didn't understand the, the context of, of the fringe, uh, you'd think, wow, that appeared out of nowhere. Um, but we'd been producing stuff with the city um, for you know, decades. Um, we used to produce the, the Northbridge Festival with with the city, and it's um, you know the, the connections are already there to allow us to, um, I guess, have a very direct conversation with with key staff members as much as anything else. Um, Rooftop movies is an interesting one because it's very site driven, and um, you know that that car park rooftop. Um, we first um, staged a dance work up there back in two thousand and two as part of an outrage festival, and. Um, you know, it's such an amazing site that um, kind of bubbling away is like, how, how can we use that site more? Um, it's an amazing, you know, elevator that goes straight to one of the, the best views of the city and, you know, has disability toilets already there. It's, it's amazing, you know, um, from a production point of view. Um, so how that happened was that, you know, we had to convince City of Perth parking that it made economic sense. So we really tracked the use of that, that top level of the car park for a six month period so that we could do the maths and say, look, it's an under, underutilised resource. We reckon if we do this and attach parking fees to it, you'll generate this much additional parking revenue. Give us a go, we'll do the analysis and if it doesn't work, then we won't do it again. But of course it worked and yeah, that's why it keeps happening every year. So. Um, I, you know, finding interesting ways to, to work with, with the city has always been, I guess, part of how we, how we get things done. Yeah. Does that make this awkward for me? <laughs> 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 okay. um, how do you respond? Oh, sorry, there's, there's someone sorry. behind you. Yeah. I'm just wondering, um, something I found really interesting, um, as someone who does research into arts and culture in West Australia, is we have this strange attitude towards particularly heritage and you know, remembering back in like the 60s and things like that when there was big migration and they went through and they started, you know, tearing down these boots and we found that the attitude has started to shift back that we actually need to work with these sites to maintain them and actually, you know, start to reuse them instead of just knocking them down because, you know, that's old and we don't want them. Yeah. I'd say, um, I mean, I've had the privilege of having some, you know, private tours of the works and development with the old treasury buildings, and mm. that is, it's going to blow people away the way that's being um, handled. You know, it's uh, because it's not, you know, the most exciting repurposes and reuses of these spaces isn't about trying to bring them back to their former glory. Mm. It's about using all the, you know, all of the great tools that we've now got at hand to keep the fabric, obviously, mm. but then. You know, really introduce new uses into them and um, yeah the, the spaces in there are going to be extraordinary but I think I don't know whether it's um, you know there was such a, a long period in Perth I mean the 90s in Perth I found really great that was when Jack Sue Gallery was happening and um, you know it was a recession and there were like you know four different artist squats just along Murray Street um, and there was a different kind of of life going on um, very different to, to today, you know, where it's it's um, these spaces are finally coming coming back from just being empty for, for forever, and uh, you know the new wave of, of residents residential occupation of, of the city is going to be fantastic. Um, I just wish there were a few more super towers like right smack in the middle. If anything, I personally I think the the link could have gone a bit gone a bit harder on the high density you know, living scenario. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, if you could 
offer any advice of people working with project managers, working with heritage sites, what would it be? Advice to, for project managers? Running projects or design or even working within heritage buildings to activate them. Mm. Um, not to be afraid, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, heritage has kind of this, this kind of weird air of <laughs> kid gloves or something around it. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these buildings are, are robust. They've lasted a really long time already. Um, so certainly when we did the, the occupation of the, the Treasury buildings for the Fringe Festival, um, that was such a great opportunity because there are obviously certain things that we couldn't go, go near um, and that was made very clear to us. But a space that's just about to, to go through a big refurbishment is also a space where you can really go for it. Um, yeah. And of all the spaces that you could reactivate in Perth, is there any other particular <laughs> space? I mean, like Perth has a, such an incredible history and such mm. empty spaces around. Is there somewhere that you'd love to see reactivated? Um, yeah, look, the Savoy is amazing. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's one of those spaces that part of the, the big shift that happened in the urban fabric in Perth in the, in the um, 70s and, and early 80s was essentially all the shops being put into the, the ground floors, which then cut out all um, access into the, the upper stories. And I mean, this is, this is one of the things um, with uh, disability access laws. As soon as you change the access purpose of a building, um, you can't, like, you've, you've got to meet contemporary compliance laws. You, like, you need to put in lifts and da da da, da and it becomes an incredibly expensive exercise. Um, one of the reasons that Melbourne has so much more upstairs stuff going on is because they never stopped using their upstairs. So they've never had to, um, you know, make it contemporary compliant in terms of disability access. So that's, that's one of the things that's holding back. There's some amazing upstairs spaces still throughout the city. Um, but it'll um, take some brave souls and with a bit of money to, you know, to make them, make them activated again. The McNess Arcade as well, that's an incredible space. Yeah. Last question? Last question. Well, you thanks. Know, with the yeah, talking look, piece in the cup, you yeah. were saying, I don't believe it's connected to the church. And I said, oh, it must be connected to the church because it's right there. There yeah. has to be some yeah. sort of connection to the building and the sculptural yeah. piece. Because I, all, all that came to me was the priest and he's walking down and the, yeah. the fabric moving. And that's all I thought was the fabric yeah. flowing and moving. Good, good last question. Yeah, <laughs> Karen. <laughs> Spirituality and hope and faith. Yeah, 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 and and that's the bang on that whole. He said, "I'm on the wrong path." <laughs> no, no, you're front and center. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. No, really, like um, you know, it didn't um, sell this idea of the proposed work. It was an international yeah. competition, sure. and it was to relate to Saint George okay. in some way. And um, the dean of the cathedral, John Shepherd, is you know, a very open-minded yeah. person. Is is amazing. Um, and uh, that kind of hidden layer of historical reference is, isn't what it's meant to communicate. It's meant to communicate, you know, hope and, and feel uplifting. And, um, you know, I talk a lot about the, the spirit related to it. Yeah, um, okay. you know, I'm, I'm not much of a church person myself, but, yeah. you know, I still believe in the elevation of the spirit. Sure. Um, and as an abstract work, uh, you know, I hope it captures that. Your your reference to the um, the priest cloak, if you will, was kind of kind of great because it's it's also referencing like a, a sample of um, all of the paintings of Saint George, where he always has like a flowing cloak behind him, oh, which, yeah. from a traditional you know painting point of view, is kind of where the the wings of an angel would normally be. Oh. That was a reference point. But one of my favourite responses to the work is is from my grandma. Who you saw? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Who, when she saw it, she said, "Oh, it's like when you um, pull a sheet off the line and catch the sun in it." Oh, yeah. that's a lovely line. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, no, you could tell your husband it's not. It's not kind of literal. No, it's not husband and partner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you're living in sin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.